Oh, 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 oh. In this lesson, we will become the artist that home. <clears throat> you will need a paintbrush or pencil and a blank canvas as we will practice the five steps toward drawing a molecule's Lewis structure. We will also see that when multiple Lewis structures can be drawn for a single molecule, we will use formal charges to determine the best structure. Lewis structures are a way to visually represent the arrangement and bonding of atoms within a molecule and are essential for understanding the properties of molecules. Lewis structures use lines to represent bonding pairs of electrons. Multiple lines represent multiple pairs of bonding electrons. And dots represent non-bonding electrons. Most of the time, dots come in pairs called lone pairs. There are five general steps to drawing a valid Lewis structure from the starting molecular formula. I'll go through the steps on this slide, but then we'll apply them to a few practice molecules. First, you'll want to place the atoms. Generally, the atom with the lowest electronegativity is placed in the center. The order that the atoms are written in the molecular formula often indicates which atoms are bonded together. Then you'll add up the valence electrons of all the atoms in the molecule. You'll have to add or subtract valence electrons if the molecule has a charge. Remember, you can use the column numbers from the periodic table to determine how many valence electrons that atom has. Then draw single bonds from the exterior atoms to the central atom, subtracting two valence electrons each time you do. Once all the atoms are bonded to the central atom, place the remaining valence electrons around the atoms to give them a full octet. Start with the outer atoms and end with the central atom. Next, check your work. Does each atom have a full octet? Did you use exactly the number of valence electrons that you counted? If so, you're done. If not, You'll have to use lone pairs from the outer atoms to form double or triple bonds with the central atom until everyone has a full octet. Now, you can hear these rules a thousand times, but you won't get anywhere unless you get your pencils dirty. Let's work through these four examples over the next four slides. The first example is nitrogen trifluoride. Step one is to place the least electronegative atom in the center, which is nitrogen. We'll distribute the fluorines around the central atom. Next, we'll count up the number of valence electrons each atom brings to this molecule. Nitrogen has five valence electrons and each fluorine has seven valence electrons. This compound is uncharged. So the number of electrons we're working with is five plus seven plus seven plus seven, which is 26. Now we'll draw single bonds to connect each fluorine atom to the central nitrogen. We drew three bonds, meaning we used six total electrons, leaving us with 20 remaining electrons. We'll use these remaining electrons to finish out the octets starting with the outer fluorine atoms. Draw lone pairs until you run out of electrons. We'll give each fluorine atom three lone pairs, which takes six electrons each. After filling up the fluorines, we will have two electrons remaining, which we place on the central nitrogen atom. Now, time to check our work. Does each atom have a full octet? Fluorine does. It has six non-bonding electrons and two bonding electrons. Nitrogen does too. It has two non-bonding electrons and six bonding electrons. Remember, each single bond has two electrons in it. We've also used exactly the correct number of valence electrons, 26. This structure checks out. It's a valid Lewis structure. Good job, but let's make it harder. The next up is PCL2 minus. Note that this ion has a negative charge, which will give us one extra electron to work with. If you're brave, try pausing the video here and working out this structure yourself. 
We'll place phosphorus in the center since it's the least electronegative. Another tip is that the molecular formula is usually written with the central atom first. Anyway, place the two chlorine atoms on the outside. Next, count up the valence electrons. Phosphorus brings five valence electrons, and each chlorine brings seven. Remember that the negative charge adds an additional electron, which brings us up to a total of 20 electrons. Another hint for you is that most molecules in the world have an even number of valence electrons. So if you ever count up an odd number in step two, you might want to check whether you've forgotten the charge on one of the molecules. Now, we'll draw bonds from each chlorine to the central atom. This uses up four electrons, leaving us with 16 valence electrons remaining. We'll use these 16 electrons to give each chlorine a full octet, then add the remaining electrons to phosphorus. Now, we should check our structure and ask if each of the atoms has a full octet. And it does. Excellent. Notice that in this drawing, we indicate the charge outside some brackets. This is because a compound's charge is extremely important and has to be indicated. However, is there a way to know which atom specifically holds that extra negative charge? Why, actually, there is. We can calculate the formal charge of each atom in a molecule, which indicates the approximate charge that atom feels. As with oxidation number, the sum of the formal charges on each atom must equal the charge on the whole molecule. Let's calculate the formal charge of each atom to find out where the negative charge lives. We'll use the formula shown in blue at the top. So this chlorine starts out with seven valence electrons. It's making one bond and has three lone pairs. Each lone pair contains two unshared electrons. So the equation is seven minus one minus six, which equals zero. This chlorine does not have a charge. The right chlorine exhibits the same bonding as the left chlorine and will have the same formal charge as the left chlorine, also zero. Moving to phosphorus, phosphorus has five valence electrons. This phosphorus is making two bonds and has two lone pairs. Five minus two minus four is negative one. So the central phosphorus atom carries the negative charge in this species. We indicate that phosphorus carries a negative charge by putting a minus inside a circle next to the phosphorus atom. Back to the drawing board with a harder molecule, dicarbon tetrahydride, or as it's commonly known, ethylene. If you're brave, pause the video here and try to draw this one yourself. This molecule has two central carbon atoms and hydrogens on the outside. Hydrogens can never be central atoms as though they can only ever make a single bond. Counting our valence electrons, each carbon brings four and each hydrogen brings one, which gives us a total of 12 valence electrons. If we connect each of the atoms together like shown, we use a total of 10 electrons and with our two remaining electrons, we'll try to complete the atom's octets. Remember that hydrogen only needs two electrons to have a full outer shell. So when we're drawing Lewis structures, hydrogen will always form a single bond and a single bond only. Hydrogen can never have any lone pairs. It can never make multiple bonds. So I give the right atom a lone pair and it's time to check our work. But this doesn't look good. That left carbon does not contain a full octet. Now we need step five, moving one of the lone pairs to be a bonding pair with the deficient atom. I've put that double bond between the two carbon atoms and let's check our work. It seems that all of the atoms, especially those carbons, have a full octet. Time for another example, 
N2 is the most prevalent gas in our atmosphere and in your lungs. Since there are only two atoms in N2, it's quite easy to determine their placement and add up the number of valence electrons. Connecting our two nitrogen atoms together takes two valence electrons, leaving us with eight remaining. If I distribute the electrons around nitrogen evenly, then neither nitrogen atom has a complete octet. Changing one lone pair to a bonding pair still won't give us a complete octet around each nitrogen. So in this case, we have to create a triple bond between the nitrogen atoms. A triple bond is the biggest covalent bond we'll make in Chem 101. The triple bond in nitrogen explains the element's low reactivity. In fact, I bet you didn't even notice the nitrogen surrounding you every day. Typical. Last example, carbon dioxide. We'll put carbon in the center and add up the valence electrons. It takes four electrons to connect each oxygen with the central atom, leaving us with 12 remaining valence electrons. I'll distribute the remaining electrons around the oxygen atoms, but it's clear to me that carbon does not have a full octet. I'll have to move some of my lone pairs to become bonding pairs. When I do, this is what I get. An oxygen triple bonded to carbon and another oxygen single bonded to carbon. But when I sneak a look at my identical twins answer, I see that he's drawn a different structure. In his structure, both carbon oxygen bonds are double bonds. And when we check these structures, we see that they are both valid Lewis structures. But the real molecule carbon dioxide only fits one of these two Lewis structures. It can't have both a triple bond and a double bond. But how do we figure out which one is correct? In order to find out, we need to calculate the formal charges for each atom and compare the two structures. Each of these carbons is wearing four bonds and nothing else, so they each have a formal charge of zero. In my Lewis structure, the left oxygen has a formal charge of positive one, and the right oxygen has a formal charge of negative one. I'll indicate both of these with formal charge icons. In my twin structure, both oxygen atoms have a formal charge of zero. The best Lewis structure minimizes the number of formal charges, meaning my twin structure is the best since all of the formal charges are zero. Sometimes you will still have competing Lewis structures with the same number of total formal charges. When this happens, put the negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom. For example, there are two possible Lewis structures for S2O, but the dominant form is the right one since oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. <laughs>